thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's uh, it's actually great to it's not here. It's great to have uh, be able to see everyone here in person. We we tried to do this was it three years ago almost, and we had to postpone it because of COVID. So finally, nice to be able to see all the faces again. <clears throat> so today I'm gonna. Uh, kind of do the usual uh, overview we've done a few times in the, in the past. I'm going to talk about what we've been doing in Trino for the past uh, year or so, and, and then we're going to talk about some of the things that are going on that are pretty exciting uh, in the future. This year, uh, we celebrated the 10th birthday of Trino. So, happy birthday, Trino. <laughs> It's been, um, it's been a pretty uh, amazing ride from back in 2012 when it was just four of us sitting huddled around uh, four desks back at Facebook to now where we have thousands of people using Trino every day, com thousands of companies, developers contributing every single day. So it's pretty amazing. It's, it's great, great to have uh, such a big community of users and developers. So thanks, everyone. So. Just to give you uh, some rough idea of uh, what's been going on over the <clears throat> past year or so, we, well, project has been growing like crazy. Like, uh, as always, like, it's up and to the right. Uh, we have more than 600 contributors, if you can come from the beginning of the project. We have more than 8,000 members on our Slack channel. This is 10x the number of people that were in, in the channel in 2018. So that's uh, pretty amazing. Lots of, lots of people joining, asking questions about how to use Trino. Lots of people interested in, in contributing to the project. Uh, so if you're not on Slack, that's the place you want to be. So join. Uh, we've done uh, 35 releases this year. We've always had this goal of doing one release every about one to two weeks. So we've, we've in improved the processes over the past uh, year or so to try to keep up with that, uh, with that pace. So thanks, Cole and Manfred. They've been uh, helping with that uh, a lot. And we've been able to, uh, to keep that, um, that going, except for this week, which uh, we've been preparing for the summit and we haven't had a chance to do it. Um, so then uh, this year, in terms of uh, activity, there's more than 3,900 3, commits. And this is. If you look at the history of the of the project, this is the year where uh, we had the most activity in the project. 50% uh, of all the changes happened in the last four years. So, and the project is 10 years old, so it's been accelerating. And and this is has been even even if you if you take into account that there's st still two months left for the uh, to finish the year, it's been the busiest year for the project so far. A lot more people involved, a lot more contributions. A lot of very, very big changes uh, and improvements, very visible changes. Uh, we're going to cover some of those uh, now. And the project has been getting more widespread, more visibility. Uh, it's a lot more people talking about it. Uh, this just gives you an idea of uh, the, the stars uh, people gave on the, to the GitHub, GitHub project. So if, if you haven't given, given a start, go do it. Uh, it helps with making the, the project more uh, visible and, and more people aware of it. So let's take a look at some of the, the features, main features and main, main things we, uh, we, we uh, pressed a, a Trino gain in the last year. Uh, there's, first of all, I, I'm going to talk about a couple of um, user visible features in the language. There's merge. It, it's, it's a SQL construct. allows you to, um, you can take one table, uh, and you can update that table by, by looking at rows in a different table, and you can decide whether you want to delete, insert, or update rows into, in, into that second table. So you can, you can think of it as a, as a way to combine an insert, update, and delete in one shot. Uh, it's, it's a much more expressive way of doing those operations. And it's very, very useful if you're doing ETL and you're, you're importing data, you're trying to combine it into an existing uh, data set. And, and you want to represent these operations without having to run separate queries. Uh, uh, and, and of course, with the performance implications of not having to uh, run multiple queries and scan the data multiple times. Uh, so this is already in, in, the, in the distribution, in Trino distribution. There are a few connectors that support it. Um, there's the Hive connector. I think the Iceberg connector supports it, uh, Kudu, and a couple others. And, and Delta, Delta connector. 
So uh, give it a try. Uh, this this has been a, a complicated feature. It's been in the making for about two years almost. Uh, so we finally were very proud we, we could uh, get that in. Oh, uh, one one more comment on on that one. We are also internally rebuilding some of the infrastructure for updates and deletes on top of this feature because this the way it's implemented it unlocks some use cases that were impossible with updates and delete so it's going to make it even more powerful for those the the next feature is a set of uh, uh, features around man manipulating json so the sql 2016 specification added a set of functions to query json and to uh, uh, assemble json objects and arrays and so on uh, we finally implemented those in, in, in Trino. It, it basically adds additional first-class syntax for dealing with JSON path expressions and, and to create JSON arrays and objects. So as you can see in this example, you can query, you can run a JSON query over, over some text field that contains JSON, and, and you can ex, uh, specify a JSON path expression that is much more powerful than what you can do today with the existing functions like JSON extract and JSON extract scalar. Uh, you can look at doc documentation; it's pretty extensive in that in that link. We also added support for table functions. This is one of those superpowers that a database can can have. Uh, Trino supports scalar functions, window functions, aggregation functions. And with this, it's, it, it supports a new kind of function that were impossible before. <clears throat> so a table function, in a nutshell, is a function that can produce a table. So it, it can optionally take tables as inputs, but uh, fundamentally, the, the important thing is it can produce a table. You use it in the context of a from clause, and, and then you, you, your invocation, that function generates a table, and then you can query it like a, a, any other table. The, the implementation right now has a few limitations, but uh, it's already pretty powerful, and we, we're continuing to improve it. In this example, you can see it's a function that allows you to query Oracle, and you can specify a Oracle query as an argument to the function. So this, this is, uh, we generally call it a, a query pass-through, and we support that function for Oracle, for MySQL, Postgres, and any other uh, DBMS that Trino supports. So what it allows you to do is you can use the syntax of those underlying databases when uh, sometimes Trino doesn't support that or there's specialized uh, functionality that you want to take advantage of. In this case, you can see how you're able to select from an Oracle table and use the model uh, feature from Oracle, which is not part of the standard. It's not, not something that Trino supports natively. This is already super powerful. The, the functions, uh, anyone can write functions. There's an API for doing that, so you can implement your own table function if you want. The other major, and this is kind of under the covers um, uh, feature, it's not, not something that users see directly, is the ability to run queries uh, and tolerate failures in the cluster. For example, I, uh, historically, when, when a Trino node crashes, if you're running a query that is executing that node, the query will fail. We, we did a lot of work over the last year to allow Trino to restart the execution of tasks on the, on the nodes that fail. This is a completely different execution model. Uh, we had to do a, a major refactoring and changes in the, in, the, in the engine, but it brings an entire new set of capabilities to the engine, something that just wasn't possible before. Of course, when you have uh, that level of uh, gran uh, fault tolerant, uh, granular fault tolerance, it allows you to do things like, for example, you can run on spot instances on, on AWS or some kind of ephemeral instance, and if those instances go away, your query transparently continues to execute. So it allows you to run uh, workloads on cheaper hardware without uh, the, the, the issues of workloads failing and, and bad user experience. Uh, the, the other major benefit of this feature is it allows you to run queries that need more memory than what the cluster contains. So one of the limits, historical limits of, of a Trino installation is if you want to run a query, say, uses five terabytes of memory, you have to have five terabytes of memory on your distributed cluster. 
So that, of course, means uh, you have to have more hardware, etc. So with, with this feature now, you can have smaller clusters and, and still be able to run those, those workloads. So in a way, it's, it's a way to uh, do better resource allocation and utilization. You can have smaller clusters for memory bound, bound uh, workloads without having to waste a bunch of CPU uh, that's idle because you cannot take advantage of it. There's a host of other improvements. I'm not going to go over all of them, but just uh, quickly highlight a few. We updated we, uh, up until early this year, uh, Trino was using Java 11. We updated it to run on Java 17, both uh, for the runtime and for the uh, build time compilation. This allows us to start taking advantage of a lot of new language features in Java 17, which makes the code base easier to manage better. And, and of course, there are improvements in the runtime, like garbage collection is better, the, the JIT compiler in Java 17 is better, so you get a speed bump and, and performance improvements just from, from using Java 17. Uh, one of the big features we have is the ability for connectors to uh, provide functions at runtime. You, 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 so just like a table and, and, and a view, th those, concept, those entities are resolved at runtime when you run a query, functions now have the same, the, the same treatment. So you don't need to register your functions ahead of time by deploying a, a plugin. You can have a, a, a plugin def uh, define them on the fly at runtime. Um, so this, this right now it's just the capability, uh, the capabilities present in, in Trino. Um, this opens the door for a lot of things that we can do in the future, like for example, supporting uh, custom uh, functions in custom languages, like it could be JavaScript, Python, or whatever other languages someone might, might want to do, or even a remote execution of functions. We made a bunch of improvements to the Python client. Uh, now we have people actively working on, on improving it, bringing it up to, uh, the same compatibility level we have with other clients, like the JDBC client and so on. And we're re releasing on a more regular basis, so if you are relying on the, on the Python client, you should be uh, seeing some improvements there. And then we have three major connectors that were added this year. The Delta Lake, Maria, and Hui connectors. Uh, there's, Delta Lake is very actively being developed. Uh, same thing with Hui. So if you if you are using those systems, you can start taking advantage of integrations with them. And then we have over the past year, and actually over the past couple of years, lots of performance improvements. Everywhere from uh, improvements for joins, aggregations, and nest, uh, inserts. Uh, well, of course, uh, merge and all that get some of the benefits from that. And well, there's a, a list of a bunch of other improvements that I'm not going to go into too many details now. All right, for the rest of the of the year and and what we're looking looking forward to, there's a, a few projects that we're we're starting. We've talked about uh, Project Hummingbird a few times. Uh, we haven't talked too much about it, but uh, we kind of hinted at it. So Trino, I mean, as you all know, Trino well, is fast. One of, one of the key, key design points from the beginning was it has to be fast. We, we need to be fast enough to be able to interact with queries over massive data sets when we were at, uh, back at Facebook in, in 2012. We optimized a lot of the, the core execution uh, parts of the, of the engine, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. And one of the things we're starting to look at uh, now is what, what are those improvements we can make? There's a couple areas that we've already identified uh, that we started working on. One, one of them is, the, is how Trino deals with hash tables for aggregations and joins, and how it, how does it manage the state for the aggregations, the, the, um, the, the, lookup key, the lookup for the keys, and so on. So we're taking a holistic view of that and, and revamping those those implementations. So we're already seeing some, like in, in prototyping, some uh, some potential improvements there. So that's ongoing. We're going to hopefully see some results over the next uh, next couple of months. And the other big, big aspect we're looking into is the actual evaluation engine for expressions. So Trino has a columnar evaluation engine, but it's it's lacking some some potential optimization. So we're looking at 
what can we do there to make it better. Uh, there are some things that Trino does today that could be made faster, like for example, how it manages intermediate data structures. There's a, um, uh, if you're familiar with the code base, there's a structure called Block Builder, which is used everywhere to assemble rows, assemble pages of data, so we're trying to improve uh, how, how those, those uh, data structures get assembled to uh, um, avoid wasting so much computation and CPU. The other set of things we're looking at are how we evaluate expressions. Even though it's columnar, expressions are uh, evaluated in, in one shot over a, a, a page of, of data. And by starting to break, break up those expressions into smaller expressions, we can play some, some tricks. We can make the evaluation adaptive. For example, we can at runtime profile and see which sub-expressions are more expensive than others and then swap the order of evaluation to, uh, to save on, on, uh, on CPU if the expressions are expensive or expressions are very selective. We can do that uh, first. Um, by, by, by doing that, we can also start looking at how do we offload the computation of certain expressions to specialized operations like SIMD, uh, especially with the Java 17 vector APIs, we can start leveraging that functionality. Or eventually in the future, it might be even GPUs. Like the, the point is that we, we can take those expressions and then somehow uh, offload that computation somewhere else or, or, or specialize the computation. And, and of course, if data is encoded in different ways, so if it has, if it has specific, if we know specific aspects of the data, characteristics of the data, for example, is it ASCII data? Is it, does it have any nulls in it? Um, then we can specialize the process. And if you have ASCII, then there are so many string operations that can be done more efficiently than if you're processing UTF-8 data this variable length. If you have numbers and you know the numbers are, you have a, they say, a big decimal column with, they say, say decimal 20,5, and, and you know the numbers in practice are small, then instead of relying on the arithmetic operations for large decimal numbers, which tend to be slow, they have to be simulated because CPUs don't have 128-bit math. Um, if you know the, the numbers are small, you can fall back to uh, specialized pro, uh, operations that use 64-bit math or 32-bit or math, which is much, more, much faster. If you, have no, if you know the data doesn't have nulls, then you can specialize the processing to avoid those uh, additional checks, and, and you make it easier for the CPU, the JIT compiler and the CPU to process that faster. So anyway. Lots of potentials for, for improvements here. And, and we're, we're looking into that. Uh, I, we started looking into that a, a couple of months ago, and, and we're, we're going to start identifying more and more of the uh, independent tasks that we can start uh, working on. And hopefully, we'll see incremental work over the next few months. You can follow a, uh, what's going on uh, in that link. So we have a, a list of all the things we're exploring. We're going to keep adding more information there. The second thing we're, we're continuing to work on is table functions. I said there are some limitations, specifically limitations that table functions today cannot take tables as inputs. So they have to be the leaf in your plan. You have to select from a table function that doesn't take any inputs aside from constants. So what we're adding is the ability to take uh, tables are simple, so uh, you, will, you, you will be able to execute a function that takes a, an input with this uh, table keyword, and this can be a subquery or another table. So this allows you to have a function that filters the rows that come from another table, and, and you can do arbitrary processing there. This is super powerful. For example, you could implement a function that processes or filters rows through a Python script if you wanted to. This is something that people in, in the Spark or Hive uh, world are, are familiar with. You'll be able to implement that once we have this functionality. So this is super powerful. Uh, so this is something that we're working on. Hopefully, we'll land in the next couple of months or so. We're also looking at some more experimental features. Uh, we've heard from people over the years the, they want the ability to add and drop catalogs dynamically without having to restart a cluster. So we're starting to look at some of the, I mean, what, what it takes to do that. We have, some, we have a lot of ideas. They has been working on that. It's actually a pretty complicated problem because you're dealing with loading classes, unloading. You have shared state in some cases. 
you have uh, resources that need to be accounted for, you have the, the, the you have a distributed cluster, so that has to be propagated to the whole cluster. You have transactional transactional state that you have to deal with. If queries are running and someone drops a catalog, what happens with the with the queries that are going uh, running in the system right now? So lots of open questions. We're we're narrowing that down and, and working on some of the implementations there. Uh, we're also looking at the ability to 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 trace everything that happens inside a, a query. Uh, right now, you can if you're trying to figure out what's going on with a with a system, you're trying to figure out. Where is the performance going? You can look at the CPU counters. You can explain, analyze a query. You can see which stages consume the most CPU. But you can't see the gaps. You can see you cannot see the latency between all those those stages. You cannot see that a task uh, or a split got scheduled and then it waited and then something else happened. So we're starting to work on adding tracing, which will allow allow us to trace uh, all the way from the submission to a query to the assignment to, or task to the workers, to execution of splits, end to end, and you'll be able to build, ideally, a, a full, uh, like a waterfall uh, diagram of what happened with a query. So that will help make it easy to figure out are there latency issues due to Trino talking to external systems like metadata systems? Uh, are there issues between the scheduling of, of splits and tasks across worker nodes? Are there issues with communication between workers? Uh, issues with communicating with the data sources and so on. So hopefully we'll add a level of visibility that we don't have today. And then because we're thinking of implementing this using open telemetry, it will be possible to integrate this into uh, tools like uh, I mean, Datadog and, and anything that open telemetry can, can feed, the, feed uh, the events to, like um, I think Jaeger, Datadog, and a few others fall in that category. We're also looking at a couple of new connectors. They're in progress, Snowflake, Ignite. Uh, some of the folks from Bloomberg have been working on Snowflake connectors, so hopefully we'll get that in very soon. And of course, many performance improvements, many improvements in connectors. There's, we have, there's entire teams of people working on, on the Iceberg connector, Delta connector, Huli connector, so we'll, we'll see uh, more, more stuff there. Then uh, to to finish up here, so one of the things we're trying to do is we want to make I mean, this is something we always wanted wanted Trino to to uh, to be. We want want it to be a project that people can feel welcome. Uh, they they can join and contribute and and feel they can make an impact. It's been like a, a bumpy road. Sometimes uh, it's hard with uh, people. People get distracted. They don't have time to pay attention to things. So. We have um, now a team of people working uh, on, uh, we have de uh, de developer relations people working on making sure that anyone contributing to a project is having a good experience. We are, um, we're following up on what's going on with pull requests, making sure people get feedback, making sure peop uh, things don't, don't fall through the cracks. We're adding a bunch of automation to make sure maintainers and other people are, are involved in reviewing uh, pull requests, are aware there's something going on, and then just clarifying how people are expected to interact with the, the rest of the, of the developers in the, com in the community. We started a project, this is something that we started doing manually for now, uh, we have a huge backlog of, of pull requests, so we're, we have uh, two or three people going through that backlog every day and, and trying to identify, th is this something that's worth adding? Uh, is it something that uh, has it, has it uh, fallen through the cracks, ping the, the people that are involved, make sure that things start, start moving, and, and we're kind of trying to work through that whole backlog um, and, well, bring it to a, to a, a good, ongoing state, so eventually th there shouldn't be many things in flight that uh, people are not actively working on. So with that, um, if you wanna get involved, remember Slack, the, it's the place to be. Like that's where all the developers, all the users uh, get to ask questions, get to interact with each other, so please join. Uh, if you wanna contribute to the project, uh, you can look at that link, uh, trino.io slash development. 
he has some uh, some details about how you can go about contributing, how do you set up your environments, what are your expectations in terms of contributing, what should you expect in terms of your code getting reviewed, and so on. If you're looking for a good if you're not familiar with the code base and you're looking for something to get you started, look for the good first issue tag on GitHub. We try to tag things that we think are uh, narrowed down or, or constrained enough that, you, that someone that is new to the code base can jump in and, and, and start getting familiarized with and implement. And of course, help with uh, spreading the word. Like get, write blog posts, write and tweet about, about Trino. Like any, Anything you can do to make more, more people aware of the project uh, helps. All right, uh, we have about 15 minutes left for questions, so if you have questions, we're happy to answer. Then Dan and David are gonna come up here. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Cole, can you bring the mic? We have a microphone, so people on the on the on the virtual feed can hear the questions too. Is this working? Okay. Yeah, it works. Um, I was just wondering about connector-defined functions. Can you explain a little bit more about how you would go about defining a? a function at runtime? Uh, sure. So in um, the SQL spec, functions are actually mounted inside of a catalog in a schema. So a name for a function actually, technically, if you want to reference it, would be a fully qualified name. Um, so what we've added is the SQL path specification, which um, Cole right there wrote when he was an intern for us like a long time ago. <laughs> Five years ago. <laughs> I, I, we were at Facebook. I, I, it was like 30 ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, this has been something that's like been planned, but it was just an insane amount of work because we had to refactor everything. So the way it works is during um, when you're analyzing a query, you get a function name, and then it goes and it goes through the path and says, hey, connector, give me your function named foo and it gives it back the definitions of those functions. We apply the function matching algorithm. Then if it matches, you get a handle, and then whenever you want to execute it, you go and you fetch that handle. It's a lot, lot, lot more complicated than that, but that's generally how it works. So there's a protocol that goes back and forth the function around this. Yeah, so the, the analogy here is, well, first of all, the way they used to work, uh, when, uh, so there were some plugins that could define, could provide functions. When the plugin, when the server started, the server would say, plugin, give me all the function implementations you support. And then they would statically register and that's it. Uh, you had no way to modify that. So now the analogy is similar to how a table is resolved. So if you imagine, if you think about when you do a select from table, the analyzer says, okay, I have a table reference. And then he says, connector, do you know about this table? The connector says yes, it provides metadata, columns, fields, etc. cetera, uh, sorry, columns and types. The analyzer plans the whole query and then it says, okay, start executing and, and, and for that table, give me the data. And each of the workers says, give me a piece of the data of, of this table. So same, same idea here is the analyzer says, connector, give me, do you know this function? Okay, give me metadata about the function. There's some, some things like you said, is it um, uh, uh, is deterministic, etc. cetera, what is the signature of the function, and so on. It, it plans it, it, it incorporates it into the query plan, and then when it goes and executes, the, it says, okay, now I have this definition of the function, give me the implementation, and the connector says, okay, here's a uh, method handle, it's, it's a Java uh, low-level API, API, it says, here's the method handle, it's like basically the invocable version of the function that the engine is gonna call. That method handle can be, it's basically, think of it as a method point, uh, a function pointer type of thing. It can be backed by anything you want, or anything the connector wants to do. It can be backed by Java code, it can be bytecode, it can be another language, it could be a remote invocation to something else, 
So. Yeah. So just a word of caution, there's no connectors that implement this currently. <clears throat> I spent about a year and a half refactoring code so this was even possible. So if you want to implement it, definitely reach out to me on Slack and I'll help you out. Uh, but there's likely to be some rough corners in there. There's basically test cases so far. So as the first couple of implementations come in, expect like to find some rough edges. Uh, microphone, Cole. Picks on. Raise your hands. There you go. <laughs> Um, recently been using Trando on top of geospatial data inside of Postgres and it's really horribly slow because I believe the aggregations are not happening in Postgres, they're happening in right. Trino. Can we bypass that with a table function and just force the full push down into Postgres with a table function? Yeah. Instead of changing the connector to do geospatial uh, push downs? So, well, the, so the engine doesn't do push and automatically into table functions. So if you, you, can, you can write a query using the table function. Let me, let me back up here so you can see that. So you could, there's a query function in the Postgres uh, connector. So you can invoke that function and you can type whatever you want there. And if you, you can take advantage of the Postgres specific geospatial functions. Now, if you, want, if you do select from table and then you do where something that uh, uses geospatial, then that won't get pushed into yet. I mean, eventually we might be able to do something like that, but uh, right now it's just an opaque thing that executes. So this is like the escape hatch <laughs> when push down doesn't work and push down can only work because you're, remember, you're expressing a, a query in Trino's language with Trino's <coughs> functions and Trino's types. So when it is actually possible to translate that and someone has written the code to translate that to Postgres, that can happen. But there's cases where, like, I don't know, the functions from Postgres may work in ways that are totally different than the geospatial functions in Trino, in which case, like, you're going to have to do this. So. It's very much a case-by-case -case basis for pushdown. Uh, but this is your escape hatch. You yeah, can do but, anything you want in this. But there are, um, over the past couple of years or so, we added support for pushing down complex expressions into connectors. So it is possible to implement additional pushdown capabilities into the positive connector, for example, and, and have it understand geospatial functions. So. It's just a matter of, of saying, well, if, if some function gets, say, say ST length gets pushed down into, you have an ST, where ST length, ST length of some field in Postgres, uh, the connector can participate in that, in that push down. It can say, I, I understand that, and then it can issue that under, uh, under the covers to Postgres. So the connector needs to be enhanced for that, but. How much uh, time do we have for questions? Seven more minutes. Great. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> I, 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 I can find me later. I have, I have more answers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi. Good question about fault-tolerant execution. Uh, so it's going to be important property for uh, reliability of a service. So, so on that note, do you have to sacrifice any query performances while implementing that? Or if you can share any experiences about that property, it would be helpful. So right, right now, I think there are some, uh, so there's some impact in, la in, in latency. Uh, because of course, like when when you do fault tolerant execution, one of the things, well, let me back up a moment. When you execute today without fault tolerant execution, the execution is execution is pipeline. So if you are selecting um, just a few rows and and like and, and the, the shape of the creep is such that those rows could flow all the way to the client and and the client would see them. Um, with fault tolerant ex execution, you cannot do that because you have to run a stage and then that data gets gets staged in, in some system, then the next stage runs and so on. So th there's like a, a sequencing of execution, which uh, which means that for those types of queries, you're gonna wait longer to see your data. We're starting to look at some, some uh, changes to the, the, the way execution works to be able to do speculative execution, for example, you. you do the fault tolerant execution, but at the same time you speculate that nothing's going to fail, and you continue processing the future stages or downstream stages. If everything goes well, then you see the data sooner. 
if, every, if something fails, well, you have to restart potentially more things, but at least you didn't fail your query. So it's, it's still in progress. We're still developing it. So I would say like, try it with your workloads and see how, how it behaves for what you, you're running. Even the stuff that exists today is kind of a mixed bag. It's actually true of any performance question. So there are cases where it's slower, I don't know, 10% <laughs> in terms of latency. There are cases where it's faster because of the way it, it executes in a different style. And there's use cases where you actually get more parallelism. So your query, mm -hmm. you, you are able to use more CPUs concurrently so your query finishes faster. So like everything, you have to test it. We have a question from the stream from uh, Anjali. The question is, is Project Hummingbird expected to reduce query latency and help support interactive use cases? Um, so Project Hummingbird is about improving the performance of the core bits of the execution engine. Like this is make, make it more CPU efficient, make the hash tables, the joins more CPU efficient, make the evaluation more efficient. Of course, once you, assuming there are no artificial bottlenecks in latency like due to scheduling, if you improve CPU efficiency, latency should improve, right? Uh, but that's, that's still to be seen. I mean, we expect it to improve, but uh, once we squeeze performance in that, in that space, we'll have to see are there other areas we have to improve to reuse latency overall. See my previous answer. You have to test. It's right. completely mixed bag. Yeah, I, I think the upcoming work to add query tracing will help a lot with latency because there's probably cases where like maybe you could put some caching in a connector to improve like planning latency and whatnot. That today, those are pretty hard. It's pretty hard to tell like where the latency is. And once we have tracing, it'll be a lot easier to pinpoint those and like add very specific fixes. Hi. Um, so um, the particular use case that uh, for us is um, uh, Trino uh, with uh, ORC file format uh, in cloud storage. And uh, we're, we're really used to having to uh, be very cautious and, and test out uh, exactly file size, uh, uh, too big, too small, stripe size, too big, too small, um, you know, number of splits, uh, initial splits per worker, um, all of those factors. And I just noticed recently when I was looking up some documentation that a newer version of Trino uh, mentions uh, something called weight-based scheduling, uh, split <laughs> scheduling. And I, I wonder if that is What's that designed to help, and, and is it designed to help uh, not having to be so um, careful about uh, those about, about splits, how it re how that relates to the file format, uh, and um, um, etc. So that feature is it's uh, and I don't know if James Perry is oh James here yeah he he's the one that worked on it do you want to come here and and talk about it <laughs> <laughs> it works <laughs> thank you um, so I think the short answer is that it's not really meant for improving that sort of dynamic use case um, the general idea is that it allows uh, better query performance when you have lots of small files. So generally that's like JSON or text. Yeah, so what it, <clears throat> what it does is uh, takes into account the size of the files when it decides where to schedule the, the, um, those splits with respect to the, the workers you have available. So, because the problem is that right now, uh, before that feature, you have small files and big files, and you would randomly assign them to workers. So you may end up with a, uh, a worker getting all the small ones and a worker getting all the big ones, and then you have a skew in terms of processing. So now it says, well, if it's small, then it has a smaller f footprint, and, and then you can pack them a bit better. 
Last question. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Right All the way in the front. Great project, by the way. I love Trino. Um, <laughs> I, I want to say uh, a lot of the latency and query uh, time that we've seen in our the workloads and use cases, a lot of it comes down from network latency using app, uh, object stores. And there's solutions like Alux.io <laughs> and like uh, managed solutions that are trying to solve that. And there's even built-in S3 caching that even tries to alleviate that problem, right? Uh, but it's still like caching, and then there's another layer of complexity to manage. Are there plans somewhere in your roadmap to improve the assumptions or thing, the way Trino is optimized for to work more with cloud native object stores? Or is using a caching layer like you know, a permanent thing that you just have to adopt because that is the way to go? Uh, I don't know if David has an answer, but my, my answer is uh, we typically don't have latency problems with S3. Like S3 is pretty good it's i i think i think of storage system as is it faster than my engine is and if it is then i don't care how fast it is because it's not the bottleneck anymore typically we're not seeing that with s3 there are edge cases obviously like with any system you do if you lay out your data in a way that's anti to the way it's designed you're going to have a bad time so you need um mechanical sympathy for your storage system um like tuning your file sizes and things like that. Um, there are other storage systems from other cloud providers who I will not call out that are extremely bad that you will need a caching system with, um, which is unfortunate. Like those companies are aware of it and they are trying to work on it, but like it is the reality of at least one cloud provider. Yeah, typically latency is a problem for things like metadata or like query planning. So like if your hive meta store is slow, like the query can't start until it gets the metadata. Or if you're using like Iceberg, where Iceberg has to read the, the metadata files during planning, like that happens once on the coordinator. And so if that's slow, like that's adding to the total latency for your query. But usually once the query gets running, you've got enough parallelism that it, it doesn't really matter if um, it takes like, you know, tens of milliseconds to like start reading the data. And if the storage system is slower, then you can just add more threads to compensate for that. I think we're done. Thank you.